Test, test, test. Hello. What are we talking about today? Let's see if I'm prepared in any way to talk about anything at all. What country am I in today? Let me see. Sweden, no. Germany, no. Ah, here we go. Norway. Hi, everybody. All right, cool. I don't, I don't like the Madonna thing very much. This is not comfortable. Okay. Got an hour. Sorry about the trouble there. These are rectangular screens, and it takes me a little bit to uh, get my head around what's going on there. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, Astoria ADO.net data services. And these are, um, even though they're called ADO.net, they're actually part of the SQL runtime team. And even though they're called ADO.net, they're not really ADO.net. So it's kind of a weird thing. This is a service that is um, uh, built on top of WCF, run by the SQL runtime team, named ADO.net, but not really using ADO.net. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's a stupid name. Uh, the code name was Astoria. That's a much better name. So I continue to refer to it as Astoria years, years and years after they've told me to stop. Um, I'm here to explain to you that the .NET framework is not that complicated. So I've made this diagram to explain to you. It's really quite simple. Everything's coming together, kind of multiple streams, and then those two streams are going to cross, and if you cross the streams, then really bad things can happen. Um, you don't have to get your certification if you want to know how to use ADO.NET Data Services, even though I got all of them. Uh, but I realized that it wasn't helping me find a job, so... The target scenarios for these services are really anywhere where you want to move data across the wire in a, um, an open format. We're not talking about moving binary data around across the wire. We're talking moving JSON or XML on HTTP. All of this is built on top of WCF. And it'll let you talk to really any kind of data, even if you don't have a database. And I'm going to give you examples of that. That means it's good for pulling, pulling data into AJAX applications into Silverlight or mashups. It's easy to manipulate your data from JavaScript. I think personally that these data services are kind of the best kept secret at Microsoft. I don't know why it's a secret. They should be telling everybody. But I, I just don't think that a lot of people use this stuff. Is anyone here actually using ADO.NET data services in, at, at work in production? OK, no one. Has anyone heard of it before they sat down today? OK. So that's good. So about 40% you know, of you have heard of it. I, I think that's unfortunate. I think this is really the most productive thing that we've got as far as being able to sit between clients that we already know how to write and servers and services that we mostly know how to write. It fits right in the middle there and allows us to enable both of those things. It's not the WS star. You guys have probably done web services before, WS security and things like that. Sometimes people call it WS Death Star because it's just so scary. There's so much going on when you're doing web services this way. That's the one side of things. WF, WS Star is the big, scary enterprise. You know, People who talk a lot but don't code usually talk about this stuff, enterprise architects. On the other side, the non-business person, uh, they'll do POX. This is called plain old XML. This is where you go to a client and they say that they do web services, but this just really means that if you give them a URL, they'll, they'll give back some XML that they just made up. There's probably no schema. It's just really angle bracket delimited files. Um, it's just a lie. They think it's web services, but it's really not web services. Somewhere in the middle are the REST people. REST is called, um, actually stands for Representational State Transfer, which is a, another stupid acronym that doesn't mean anything. REST people are almost religious in their enthusiasm for REST. We call them Restafarians. And the Restafarians think that, you know, hey man, that's how they talk because they're Restafarians. Hey man, you know, HTTP has all these great verbs, man. We should use them. I, don't, I can't do a Restafarian guy, so I'll do a surfer dude instead. Um, yeah, man, what's your Restafarian talking about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you can't understand what they're saying. Uh, Rastafarians believe that HTTP is something that we should care about and we should worship, so they want to take not just get and post the HTTP verbs that we're familiar with, but also put 
and delete and use them and map them directly to CRUD. Remember CRUD, create, read, update, delete. So you've got this interesting um, kind of continuum between the WS Death Star, the Rastafarians, and then the Pox people who are just fooling themselves. What Astoria tries to do is be a, a restful interface for any kind of data, not just data that's on SQL Server, where that data is resources, things that you can pull across the wire, uh, and you've got HTTP methods to act on those. The data is resources, just like, you know, I do a get, I give you a URL, you give me a GIF. That's just kind of how the web has always worked. Why couldn't that thing that came across the wire be a business entity of some kind or some, something I could actually act on? That's what the Restafarians say. And they'll say, well, I'm going to do a post. Why don't we make that an update? So I'll give you a person object. I'll say post, boom, update. I'll do a put for a create and a delete for a delete. And now we've just come up with a very nice, clean way to do creates, reads, updates, and deletes. And they're saying, well, HTTP is great. You've got caching and there's proxies. You've got authentication. All this stuff is done for you. If you think about what SOAP was trying to accomplish. Remember that SOAP was simple object access protocol, right? There really weren't many objects involved. It certainly wasn't simple. It was hard to access. I mean, SOAP just kind of failed completely. Coming up with envelopes and headers to express things that were already being expressed in HTTP. SOAP tried to be HTTP nonspecific. People always said, yeah, you can do it over HTTP, but you could also put your SOAP message in an email or a queue, except no one ever did that. 90% of SOAP was done over HTTP. That's where the rest of Farian say, hey, let's just use the greatness of HTTP. It is its own envelope. It has these semantics already. Additionally, the idea that the URL is a powerful thing and it has a syntax to it where every bit of information is potentially addressable gives them one more reason to want to use this. Plus you add in a thing called Atom and Atom is kind of like RSS. Uh, you guys are familiar with RSS, right? And RSS is really simple syndication for bringing blogs and stuff down. Except RSS doesn't care about XML. It just kind of looks like XML, but there's no schema. It's not really strongly typed and it's really focused on blogs. Atom is RSS reinvented, non-specific to blogs, caring deeply about XML and about schema and about XML just generally. So it became a standard. Atom Pub is this protocol for talking about data. And Astoria supports that fully. So the way that I want to explain this to you guys uh, is just to do a big old pile of demo. So let's switch over here and let's think about what the best way to do this is. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me... You know, let's do this. Let's start, let's start completely from scratch. That'll be fun. It's always nice to just go completely off script and show you guys something uh, different. Okay. Let's just do this. Let's make a new project. And let's make, let's make a console application, because all business problems eventually start with a console uh, application. And uh, since we're doing that, you know, really all business problems start with the Northwind database. So we'll... We'll throw a little of that action in here. Let's bring up the file new dialog. And I've never understood if this was alphabetical or just in any random order. Ah! Uh, let's make some uh, link to SQL classes, and I'll say Northwind. I'm just going to use link to SQL as the example, just as a place to pull some data from. But we'll be pulling this from, from all over the place. Uh, and I'm just going to grab in some uh, products. OK? And then I'll go over here to my program. Make sure you guys can see that OK. And we'll say uh, var db equals, and I'm going to go ahead and try. I've got, a, I've got code rush installed. I'm going to just turn that off real quick. Don't want to cheat. Var db equals new Northwind data context. This is just linked to SQL. I brought in that linked to SQL stuff, and I drug a couple of tables there. This just gave me some way to get some data. Var query equals from db uh, from p in db dot products where p dot unit price is greater than ten. Select p uh, for each product p in query console dot right line p dot Product name, say. 
All right, thrilling. Wow, I'm so glad I came to this talk. Hanselman's really, really doing some amazing stuff there. Oh, I hit F1. No. No. Oh, phew. I thought I was going to load MSDN and then we'd have to all leave because <laughs> nothing was going to get done. Okay. If you count the SQL Server, this is a two-tier application, right? Console talks to database. Yay. And let's put a breakpoint there, and let's do an F5. And we're going to hover over query. Query is null. I'm going to bring query up in the watch window. We can see that link to SQL has turned that into some SQL. So that link query, that language integrated query, knew that we were talking to SQL Server, and it generated some SQL. And it may not be necessarily pretty, but it kind of looks like what we thought it would, right? Select some stuff from products where unit price equals zero. Yay? OK, not impressed. But it's a two-tier application. Thing talks to database. All right. Now, let's make a, and then there's our stuff there. Hey, that looks like a Norwegian word. It's got a lot of umlauti things on it, right? No? Swedish? Sorry. God. Oh, God. Those poor Swedes. All right, let's add a new project, and let's make it a web project now. So we're going to add a web application. All right. And I'm going to go over here. I'm going to delete the Northwind stuff so the console doesn't have a connection to the database anymore. Okay, And that's probably not going to compile, right? Yeah. So it doesn't know about anything anymore. See how Northwind data context and product have just kind of like forgot themselves. All right. Now, over here, we're going to say add new item. This is in the web server. And we're going to pick an ADO.NET data service. This is our Astoria service. And I'll call it Northwind. Dee, 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 dee. Hit add. Now, this created a little .svc file which is actually not interesting at all. There's just one line in it. And then it created this svc.cs. And this is kind of interesting because they've put a to-do here inside of two angle brackets because we're doing generics here. So they're saying Northwind data service of T, where T is some type. And in this case, they've actually put a to-do inside of that, which is interesting. We haven't told them about any databases yet. So now I'm going to go and do the same thing we did before with the console app, and I'm going to tell this thing about the database. So the web server will know about the database. Let's tell him about Northwind. And again, I'm using link to SQL because it's fast, but I could have used any link to entities or um, uh, n hibernate or whatever makes you happy. And I'll even show you ways to do it without the database in a, in a moment here. We'll bring products over here. I'll even bring over categories for fun. You can see the category and product have a relationship with each other, which is significant, that relationship. Okay. When you do link to SQL, it generates a little designer file. I would have called it dot generated dot CS, but they called it dot designer, whatever. It's not significant other than the fact that it has some public things. Like a public class for products. We'll go see where that gets set up. Da, da, da. Here we go. Public products. So I drug over the table products, and it brought a public product set up. Now that I've got this Northwind data context, I can just tell the data service about it. So this is that one I added before. So I've got public class Northwind derives from data service of type Northwind Data Context. That's all I've done. I added that one line. Now, everything is locked down by default in Astoria. So I'm just going to, for the purposes of the demo, tell it that I want to allow access to everything with a star there, but only for the purposes of reading. So I'm going to say allow access star. You can read. No writes allowed. All right? And then we're going to go ahead and hit that. Fired up, and I'm going. And I'm going to get a build error because I'm an idiot, and this guy won't build because I forgot about that. So I'm going to go ahead and comment that out. We'll come back to him later. 
This was the console app that I had screwed up earlier. All right, so when we're going to run this, ba, 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 set up project, thanks. I want to bring it up in IE, surprise, surprise, because IE is actually better at this kind of data. So I just hit northwind.svc. Okay? I know I'm going fast here because I've got a lot of content I want to cover, but I just want to make sure what's happening here. We hit this SVC file, northwind.svc, that points to that class Northwind that knows about the Northwind data context. I told a story about a class with public properties. Okay, I'll say that again. I told a story about a class with public properties. It happened to have public products and public categories. And it returned this thing. We can see our namespaces there. Notice that three of those namespaces are W3C standards. This is always nice because as a Microsoft guy, I get to say, look, we're following a standard. Isn't that a treat? Isn't that a surprise? Look at those collections there. We've got collection products and collection categories, and they're using a term that we've seen before. And I'm going to probably ask you guys questions as an audience, and being the good one Norwegians that you are, you'll be totally quiet. Why does it say href? Where have we seen href before? Silence. What? Links. Thank you. If I had a book, I'd give you a book. I got nothing. I gave him. What? Oh, he's Swedish, so that's good. That explains everything at this point, yeah. He's been riding me hard the whole time. Uh, hrefs, links. This is a link. So wait a second. That's a relative link, right? It doesn't say HTTP or something in front of it, so that must be a relative link off of here. So I should be able to go and say products being the relative link that it is. And I get this. Looks like a feed of some kind, right? Where have we seen feeds before? Blogs. But this feed, even though it is in the default namespace Atom, a standard from the W3C from 2005, this is returning entries with XML content in our namespace. So we're automatically bringing back these entities from ADO.NET Data Services where we had that product object from the database, now looks like this. And this one here, it says products at six. Look at that href right there. I could probably then go products at six to get back one product, which makes me wonder if I can then go uh, maybe product name, which is cool. We're addressing any piece of data out there, which makes me wonder if I could go and say dollar sign value, and just get that one little value, that one little bit of information. I'm moving around inside of this entity model. And this is a, a I said entity model, I didn't say database. because. When, when some Microsoft people show this stuff, it usually involves a lot of frantic clicking, some wizards, and they go, hey, look, I put your database on the web. Woohoo!" And then your reaction is usually like, wow, he just put my entire database on the web. That's probably not a good thing. And, and I think that that's an ineffective demo that says the wrong message. What's significant about this is that we're not talking about the database. This thing isn't doing anything database specific. It's talking to that Northwind data context um, object that happened to have public properties. I'll prove that and kind of make the point about this by actually, I'm going to fire up a, um, I'm going to take a pause here. We're going to step aside. We're going to come back to this demo, okay? I'm going to pop into a new solution here. And I'm going to make a new project. I'm going to say web application. Just a regular web app, like any other ASPX app. This is nice because you can have your web pages and your Astoria data services living in the same place. And we'll go and we'll add our new um, ADO.NET data service. And I'll call him example. Okay, And he's got that same to do. And then I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to find this text file called objects.txt. I'll just grab it, and I'll put it in the code, and I'll show you what it's all about. I'm going to make just add a new class, example, 
Boom. All right. So let's see what we got going on here. I just pasted in 56 lines. And this is, you know, sometimes Microsoft guys go, yeah, look, I pasted it in. It's really easy. Yeah, yeah, click. Woo! -hoo! I'll show you what's actually going on here. Public class user has some contacts. Public context has some stuff. Public class data service. Now, I happen to call this data service, but we could call it poo. It doesn't have to have the word service in it, right? Actually, let's make it poo and see if it still works, shall we? Um, this has, yep, it's got to have that static poo constructor. Watch out. Uh, here's, in my static constructor, I'm making some fake data, just pulling it out of my, uh, <clears throat> and uh, here, we've got two properties, public users, public contacts. And we're just taking those arrays and we're turning them into iQueryable things. There's no databases here, no magic, nothing fancy going on. It's just arrays of stuff. Then we'll go over to example and we'll say, example derives from data service of type poo. I've got small children, so saying poo is just no end to the fun. And we'll fire this up. So you guys, there's no magic here, right? No databases hiding behind this thing. I'll bring it up in IE. There's users and contacts. Go into users. Go into users at one. Go into users at one's contacts. So those are the contacts for the users. Remember how one had the user had contacts? So those were related to each other. Just as we saw that relationship in the link to SQL database about categories have having products and a product has a parent category. You can move up and down in this. We've got example service users at one slash contacts. And I'm moving around inside of my entity data model, which just happens to have nothing to do with the database. That's why I think that it's kind of difficult when you hear ADO.NET data services. Everything says SQL Server, right? When this is anything, any data that you've got, you can make this happen. I actually was at a large client recently, and I enabled ADO.NET data services over some Java objects that they had. We just marshaled them into C Sharp, we turned them into iQueryable things, and we put them out on the web, and suddenly things were easier. So I think it's unfortunate that it is named this way. Okay? Now, let's go back to our other example before we uh, took a pause there. This is our web application. All right. Now, remember that console app that we had earlier that I, to I, I got rid of all the, uh, the database -y goodness? And he doesn't compile, remember, because he doesn't know about Northwind anymore. I'm going to right click and I'm going to hit Add Service Reference. And Add Service Reference brings up a little dialog here. I can type in the address myself if it was out on the web somewhere, or because I happen to have the project in my solution, I can hit Discover, and it'll fill it out for me. And then we get a little picture of some pins uh, sticking into the earth, representing Microsoft's global dominance uh, over the Internet. <clears throat> Law. Uh, let's do this. Let's bring up uh, a little tool called um, uh, TCP Trace. Because I don't, I don't want to tell this thing. Let's go back here. Where we go? I'll get lost here. I don't want to tell him to talk on local host, local host uh, whatever, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss out on something. I don't want to miss out on the fun. I'm going to lie. And I'm going to do some port forwarding because I want to see what's really happening. I'm going to tell my little tool here to listen on port 8080 and forward things to this other port. That way I'll see what's happening. Little man in the middle attack. Okay. So we'll go back here and I'll say local host, local host 8080, excuse me. And we'll hit go. And we'll call it Northwind data stuff. I can go over here and I can see that traffic. 
the first thing I noticed is that that dialog box made a call to my Northwind service. It said dollar sign metadata, which sounds like tell me about yourself. And it looks like it did. It told it about the entity data model using EDMX, the entity data model XML format. So it's telling it about the entities. That's really interesting. That kind of smells like WSDL, if you're familiar with web services. Let's go ahead and hit OK. Oops, I made a mistake. I actually put this, yeah, I put this in the console. Con uh, uh, I did this right. The console app knows about this stuff now. So I've told the console app about this. Now, this little evil earth here, I can push show all files, which is the don't lie to me button that's installed in Visual Studio. And I can see what's really happening. Look, when you, once you do that, the earth opens up and you've got things like reference. Turns out that this code was generated by a tool. <laughs> Just been insulted by Visual Studio. And it went and created a Northwind data context. Similar to the one we had before, except this one is referring to that remote stuff. This is going to allow me to come over here and say Northwind data context. Except this one, instead of the local link to SQL one that we had before, wants a URI. Wants to know, well, where is this thing? You had a database connection string before. Tell me more. So I'll say new URI. And I think it was, what were we saying, port 8080? So localhost 8080 uh, northwind.service. That sound right? Sounds right. Now, this product here used to come from a generated proxy that was handled when I did my link to SQL stuff locally. But now it's coming from that little generated proxy from the remote server. I'm not talking to the database. I'm talking HTTP to some remote place. So I had a break point there. And we'll run this guy and see what's up. Now this query, notice this is really important. That's the same link query I was using before because a language integrated query is just an expression of what I want from some data that is shaped a certain way. Just because that link to SQL stuff that was local is now way over there and I'm talking a different way, the shape of the data is the same. Products are products, categories are categories. I haven't gone and changed them. I could have, but I didn't. The shape of the data is the same. Now, when I hovered over query before, it gave me some SQL, some actual like SQL, because that meant that the link to SQL stuff got compiled into actual structured query language. What do you think it's going to be now? Swedish people. A link expression? Well, it's going to turn into a string, right? Because ultimately, all this structured data is going to turn into some kind of string. A URL. If the demo works, it will. If not, I'm going to leave. Ah, let's look at this close up. I'm going to put that in the notepad for the those of us who can't see so well. Do, 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 do. All right, that turned into a URL. The same link query. Remember that a link query isn't, this is, this is big, because this is bigger than Astoria. You may already know this, and I may be just talking to myself here, but a lot of people don't realize that this link query is just an abstract syntax, syntax tree over some shaped data. And it can get compiled into any expression, whether it be link or, in this case, a URL. This just got the exact same link query turned into a different expression. It's been, we were using link to rest here. Northwind products question mark filter unit price GT10. OK, that's interesting. Before I even let that query happen, when I, why don't we just put that into the into the uh, Internet Explorer there, right in the t at the top, and, and see if it comes back. Let's try link to, let's try up, up to $50 maybe, see if there's more expensive stuff here, or 80 That returned four things. Let's try 180 That returned one thing. So the query part is working. And this is the part where you say, 
Thanks, Microsoft, for reinventing Query Analyzer and putting it in the address bar of my browser in an obscure format that I don't care about. You really want to use tools like this link to rest to write these. You could write these yourself, though. I wouldn't think that it would be something you'd want to spend a lot of time doing. But the point here is that the fact that I can do this kind of manipulation in the browser with simple HTTP gets gives you an interoperability story that is unparalleled. Now you can think about doing this from PowerShell or Perl or Lua or whatever makes you happy. Angle brackets across the wire, right? Let's go back and finish that query and then see what else, what other kind of damage that we can do. We'll run it. Do, 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 do. Yep. There we go. Works just like before. Suddenly, our two tier application has become a three tier application. There's a number of things that you can do in Astoria. You can put in query interceptors. Um, it doesn't have to look like your data. You can say, well, if only people who are um, logged in can see this data, or maybe only people who have, have this permission can, can write. Uh, you could set it up so I only want to allow people to retrieve one item at a time rather than all of the items so that someone can't use this to you know, easily dump your database. In this case, just by using uh, the that um, add query reference, the add service reference rather, I was able to add this stuff to a, um, a simple example console application. You can also do this manually. I don't like kind of Visual Studio magic stuff a lot. You know, if you go add new service reference, I, I like to know what's really happening. There's three different ways you can do this. You could say add service reference. We could come out here to the, do, uh, the command prompt, and I can type in data SVC util. And this is going to do the exact same thing that that dialog did. Point it at a URL, and it'll generate some stuff. And then you could use it. So you could put this in your automated build. Or you can do it totally manually. There's a, there's a service, um, a query. I think it's called a query service or something that you can use that would return the data without all the strongly typed stuff. And then you could just use XML documents or something to move around in it. So you can choose the level of coupling that you want to put into this. OK? Additionally, let's take that, uh, that query. I think I've still got it in my clipboard. Let's go over to, um, to Fiddler. Fiddler's great stuff. If you, haven't, if, you haven't, if you haven't used Fiddler for this kind of stuff, just really start using it. It's awesome. Fiddler's got this thing called the Request Builder. And I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to put in uh, that query that we did before, the one that the link created for us. And just make sure this will work. I think I shut down that proxy deal, so I'm going to want to make sure my web application is running and see what um, what's it's a six three three five eight six three three five eight is our port number today. Yeah, so Fiddler is listening on localhost. We'll see if this works. Fiddler is a tool that injects itself in kind of all of your um, communications. And I pissed it off. Yeah, da -da -da -da. I'm trying to find the way to make Fiddler to knock it off. I don't know what any of these buttons do. Tell him to knock it off for a second. And I'm just going to use Fiddler to try to make some. It's possible. 63358. OK, that works. Now, oh, crap. This is what happens when you go and take the version of Fiddler you've been using happily for years and then decide to update it because it said, hey, there's a new version. How could that be a problem? Uh, 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 I wanted to stop caring about localhost for a second here. 
Well, I'll show you a different way. I'll show you a different way. All right. What I was going to try to show you, uh, apparently ineffectively, was that the header that you pass to Astoria affects how the data comes back. So in, 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 in that kind of failed example, and I, I think I can do it with, um, with this here. Let's go ahead and change that to 63358, 63358. Um, is that that data is coming back as angle brackets. It's going to come back as XML. And, uh, and now Fiddler doesn't seem to care, which is nice. That's funny. Fiddler has this request builder that allows you to type in the headers that you want to send. And if I typed in accept application, application JSON, just by virtue of the fact that I would add that one header, I'm telling it I prefer JavaScript over XML. So the amazing demo that didn't work there because I'm confused about localhost uh, was that I would say, boom, and then the exact same data would come back shaped in curly braces rather than angle brackets. And then we would all burst into cheer, or the, the sweetest people would burst into cheer. OK, so another way to show you that demo, equally as thrilling, would be to do it with, uh, let's see, let's do it with this JavaScript. OK. This default page here is going to talk to a bikes database. Now, even though this has, uh, this is an AS ASPX page, this is largely being done in JavaScript. I've added one thing here. I've added a script to dataservice.js. So this is a JavaScript library that talks to Astoria. Just like we saw before, when we did the console application, I generated a, a local .NET client. This would be the JavaScript client. There's varying numbers of clients to Astoria. That data service.js is going to talk to the bike service. So just like I had Northwind service, now we've got bike service. This is all totally client-side JavaScript. And we're going to be grabbing products from that bikes database. And then the on products loaded is going to be our callback. So it's going to make an asynchronous call. And when it comes back, it's going to call me here. OK, you with me so far? Now, because I'm stupid, I am going to string concatenate that, uh, that uh, HTML together, which is not a good idea. But yeah, people there, thank you for qu cringing there, sir, in the third row. Yeah, it's like, ooh, 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 ooh yeah, mm, OK. But uh, it'll, all, it'll all make sense. Uh, after I've left. Uh, <laughs> all right. So we're going to pull this data back. And one of the things that's neat about the data service.js file is that because you can make, you can make JavaScript objects, right? you can just attach uh, to the prototype, the columns, or in this case, the properties of the entities, are going to become properties of these JavaScript uh, items. So result at one dot product ID is going to be that, that actual product ID. We've also got name and list price. Let's fire this up. This is all JavaScript. There'll probably be a pause for a moment, because the page will load, and then the JavaScript is going to go off and then do some stuff. So there's the pause, and then the images are popping in. OK? That's all happening in JavaScript. Yay. Um, these images are interesting because if I right click on them, I'll say open image in new tab because I want to see what the URL is for that image. This is interesting. So it's products at number 700 and something slash photo. Let's go ahead and remove that slash photo. So look at this. That's the base 64 data. That's the binary goo of the photo coming back. When I say dollar sign value, that's actually coming out of the database, that's living in the database as a byte array, and then being served directly from Astoria out of the database through my entity model and into the web server and coming out here. So now I've got graphics that I can address living inside of the database, which is pretty cool. Now here's the interesting part. What is lame? about this page. What's really bad about this page? You saw it happening. You saw it loading. How many requests do you think are being made here? Right, a lot, a non-trivial amount. 
Well, let's go and uh, see what this looks like in IE, because IE is really good at, um, at looking at these kinds of services. We'll go ahead and say, uh, what was it called, bikes service? Products at 750, let's just say products. See that photo binary there? One of the things that happens uh, is that if you have your simple types like price and name and category and then an image all at the same level, we're bringing back all that data, Base64, kind of all those blobs in that first request. And then I have to go because HTML is the way that HTML is. If I want to show an image, I can't take them out of thin air, right? You can't address an image and pull it out of memory in a browser and shove it into an image tag. Image tags have to be addressable, right? So I've got image source equals bikes service, and you see I'm actually building the image tag right there. This is how we built the image tag. So I'm making one request and getting everything, including the photograph, and then I'm going to go back 700 times and get them again, right? Well, you know, if only there were some browser plugin that was rich enough to support such an exciting uh, scenario. Since I don't know Flash, I'll just uh, try it in this thing. So Silverlight would let us do the exact same thing, the same kind of data binding. It gives us a similar experience that we had before, where we're doing some link, just like this, pulling out the products. Here we're going to say, just give me the red products. This is in the Silverlight C Sharp. And I'm going to say, begin execute, and then let me know when you're done. So it's going to happen asynchronously in Silverlight. That query is going to get shoved into the data context. If you've ever messed around with Silverlight, you'll know that that has to do with data binding. So we're going to bind to that photo, convert the bytes into an image, and then we'll also put in list price and name. So in this case, we're going to be able to take that first call from the, uh, you know, from, from the Astoria client. And those images in memory will be able to bind them, lowering the amount of traffic greatly. And certainly lowering the number of calls that we're going to have to make to this thing. So let's see what that looks like. We'll load this up in... Uh in Chrome, because I like Chrome. A little Silverlight and Chrome action here. There we go. So now I've got a nice Silverlight app bound to my Astoria data service with my images and my prices and everything laid out nicely. The Astoria is such an easy way for you to take some application you already have that talks to the database directly and get it off the database. And because you've added that additional layer of indirection, you can start changing your databases and having the relationship between the the physical things in your database, the physical tables, and the entities that you choose to present can now become different. It can kind of break that one-to-one -one relationship that your client applications have. It can allow you to expose your data as JavaScript, as XML, use link to query it, bind it to Silverlight, bind it to WPF, put it in WinForms. It's just such a great way to get data out and into a client. Now, before... Uh, when I made this gentleman here ill because I was using, uh, let's just say, distasteful JavaScript techniques. I know you were going to put that in the, um, in the reviews, right? Everything was great, doesn't know anything about JavaScript. Yeah, I knew that was coming. Well, you can remember if, if, when I showed you that, uh, that slide deck earlier, I was pointing out that you can use um, all different kinds of data. Let's see if we've got that... Uh, we can pull this stuff for any different client, Silverlight apps, Ajax apps, and we can pull it from MVC. We can pull data from J you know, JSON. We can pull it from WCF. There's lots of different ways. Any way that you want, you can pull data back. Let's do this a little bit differently. Here we're going to do this from WCF, if you guys do any WCF work. Because um, Astoria is actually built on top of WCF, you can manipulate the data as it goes by. There's so many different ways that you can do this. Oops. Let's make this simpler here. Here I'm going to take that data, 
and I'm going to make some WCF contracts around it, pull back some images from a, from a different database. We're going to return these image infos. And on the client side, call them, and I'm going to use uh, what I talked about in the first talk on .NET 4. I'm going to use the JavaScript client templates, which is the preferred way that you should pull this kind of stuff into JavaScript. So here we're just going to say, get images, get that data back, and then I'm going to say, take the image list view, which is going to be some div that's sitting in my HTML there, and we're going to bind the data to it. So now I can do a template of, I wish it looked like this, using data binding expressions in the double curly brace there. You can do this thing with a story. So there's so many ways you can do this. You could pull it back over and use jQuery, which is what I do in the nerd dinner sample. You can do it the bad way that I showed you earlier with string concatenation. You can do it with clients. Once you get your data in a format that is transparent, that is angle brackets, that is curly braces, you can do anything. This can be for new people, overwhelming. And this can uh, be for uh, kind of more advanced people, like the folks that come to conferences, very empowering. Suddenly, the, the size of the Lego brick is the right size for you. And you can start realizing how I can plug these things together. It doesn't have to be so complicated. I think Microsoft's done a lot of complicated stuff in the past. I think WCF's a little too complicated. I like the layer of abstraction that Astoria gives me to pull uh, basic CRUD operations. I've just shown you the reads. The writes, updates, and deletes work the same way. Uh, it, it's the right size for me. So if I run this application, Do, 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 do. Oh, running already. I'll run it again. Breakpoint. So in this example, we pulled back some images from out of the database, and we did a binding. So this just turned into a, li a, a series of items. Go back, and we'll look at that to see what that looks like again. Just UL, unordered, unordered list, and then the name. And then you see I just said image source equals. So instead of putting it together with string concatenation, I just put it in a nice binding expression. It's a very liberating feeling to be able to get data in and out this fast. Let's um, show you a little bit about these conventions, and then we'll talk about, we'll do some, um, uh, some Q&A. So I've shown you gets. Gets are for retrieve resources. All those clients support both create and update as well. So in the example I was showing you where I could address a URL and retrieve some data, if I was going to create it, I would do a post and then give it the data in that format and post back, say, here is a bicycle or here is a product. And if I had that permission, that would go into the data as well. There is an iUpdatable interface that you would want to implement. So just as we used iQueryable as the way for us to be able to get anything and query it in any way. Any amount of data that you have on any system that supports iQueryable, then you can address it with ADO.NET Data Services. If you want to update it, then you implement iUpdatable, which teaches ADO.NET Data Services how you would do the update to your particular data service, whether it be a database or a web service or whatever. And then you've got that layer of abstraction so you can do creates, updates, and deletes. Ultimately, though, the entity data model knows only about resources. It doesn't know about your database. You have to teach it about your database. But for you to go home right now and take whatever system you have, whether it's built in Access or on an AS400, if you can just get your data into lists and arrays and put those things out as iQueryable, you'll be able to make web services, RESTful web services, across any legacy data that you have already back at the office. The conventions are really formalized for the URLs. So you saw me doing things like member access and traversal, as well as accessing things by, um, by index. So I could say, you know, give me tags with this ID. But you can also do filters, paging using top and skip. So this says, give me the top 10, skipping 30. So I can do paging really, really cleanly without having to say things about page numbers. You can also do expansion. So in the example where I have customers who have orders, rather than having to go and access each of their orders separately, I could say, give me all the customers, and while you're there, expand out to orders and get all that data in one chunk. On that example of the blobs, when I was saying, give me this data, and I was getting photographs along for the ride and then had to go get them again, 
uh, with the next version, we're going to have a thing called blob deferral that says, get everything except the blobs, and I'll go get them later. This is, this is a, a big part of our data access strategy, and it's going to be revved, so it's not something that you should be afraid of. You can you know, bet on this now. Um, you can talk to the Astoria team, team blog. If you want to learn more about this, uh, Google for Pablo Castro. He's the principal architect of this. He's got some really great deep, deep dives at Mix and at PDC in recent years where he goes into like really, really, really small details on how you can do this. This stuff is built into 3.5 SP1, so you have this already, and it gets better in 4.0. And uh, now pictures of cats. Oops, I just, I just poured Pepsi Max on my man bag. Oh no. Uh, my Merce is wet. I think that one's marginally offensive. Progress bar cat. All right, let's do some Q&A, folks. That's all I've got, but um, I'll answer your questions as long as you've got them. Sir. OK, you have an application that talks directly using SQL, using ADO.NET itself, like data sets and stuff? How will the performance be a change to this? Well, if all you do, he wants to know that he's using um, kind of standard SQL data access right now, and if he adds this, what will the performance be like? Performance in his issue for you. So with this stuff, by, by adding these layers, you're adding a lot. Not a lot in a computational sense, but you're marshalling the data in a non-binary format. So if I've got a uh, client application that talks straight SQL, that's going to talk binary over the wire. It's going to speak what's called TDS, which is the language of SQL, and it's going to be very, very tight. SQL server, client server, is very fast. In this example, we're going to have to turn that into angle brackets or query or um, curly braces, bring that into IIS and marshal across the wire. So you're going to take a performance hit. That said, for most kinds of data, that's not a big deal. If you're bringing back a couple of hundred or even a couple of thousand rows of data, um, usually the benefits of this outweigh uh, the complexity. If you were going to do a batch operation, like update 10,000 rows, then you definitely wouldn't want this kind of overhead. So I think of this as being something you'd use for like a client application, but maybe not for the administrative part of that. Any batch operation would be you know, reasonably slow on this. It really depends on if this you know, fits your scenario, if it meets your needs, it's appropriate. There is some overhead, but I wouldn't just say, yeah, do this, it'll be slow. It's not slow. It's built on WCF. WCF is very, very fast. IIS7 is very, very fast. But you can't get away from the fact that we're talking about taking data out of a compact binary format and putting it into text. So there is the, over, the overhead of that. I would say uh, measure, you know, code twice, measure once. See if it works for you. See if it works for you. This is the kind of thing where if you've got some data in a legacy database or if you're doing new data access and you need an easy way to pull this into your new AJAX system or you want to you know, bind this to data grids quickly and you have a firewall between you and you can't talk to the database, this is the answer. Flat out, this is the answer. There's no better way, no quicker way to get data onto HTTP in clear text than this. And because it's using WCF, you can secure it any way you want to. IPsec or SSL, put passwords on it. It's just running in the web browser, or in the web server rather. So you can do whatever you want. So it's about raising the layer of abstraction to a to a to a, a layer that does have some performance costs. But I, you know, I don't think it's a big deal. I would try it. Let me know. Good question. Anybody else? Anyone still awake? Ah, okay, that's a very good question. So his question is, the type that was passed in there, does it have to be iQueryable? So it's not that that has to be iQueryable, it's that the properties that it has do. So this says data service of anything, where anything has some stuff that is iQueryable. So for example, that my data service we've got, we can go in there and make these private. 
Okay. And let's call that now and see what happens. So I've given it an object that has nothing, right? So I get a service that has nothing. It's not the class, it's the properties of the class. Well, so I enumerable that you just list them out, but it is I queryable that is the magic. Exactly. Yeah. So I queryable is the magic thing. I queryable is what allows you to go and translate products at one, filter, all that 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 um, URL structure is getting translated into link across that I queryable interface. It is that I queryable interface that has this thing so powerful. That's why you could do you know over and hibernate because they have an I queryable thing. In the example that I gave of the large company that I recently worked at, uh, uh, kind of con doing some consulting, they had this Java system. I just needed to get these objects in reasonable chunks in, into memory in C sharp. I put them into list of t. And then I said list of t dot as queryable. You know, there is some overhead for holding that in memory for a second, but that is definitely um, not as big a deal as the, the, the success that we gave by actually providing the data. You, once you get into any data structure in .NET, you can make it iQueryable pretty quickly. Sir? What if you want to use put and delete? Yeah, so there's an i updatable interface. So then in that case, I would just go back over here, and I would say uh, I'd have to figure out what the um, which assembly it's in, and I would implement iUpdatable, which is an interface that Astoria provides that says, "Here are the things that I've just identified as new items within you know within this. They've been handed to me, and then you go and you do the work to put it in your database, or your web service, or your backend system, or whatever." So iQueryable is the standard interface that .NET provides in order to get data out. And the iUpdatable or whatever it's called is the Astoria thing for handling stuff that comes back in. Because you have to kind of, you know, the left hand of Astoria and the right hand is your data server, your data system. Anybody else? So polite, so quiet. All right, well, wake up your neighbors. Just shove the guy next to you, fell asleep. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>